All right. <clears throat> so as you might be able to see by the little crosshairs here, it looks like I fixed fixed the problem. Um, literally, I just closed out the program and turned it back on. But if that works, it works great. All right. So here we go. Problem number one. Evaluate the integral below, where c is parameterized by r of t, which is t, 3 cosine t, 3 sine t, and uh, t goes from 0 to pi. Our line integral that we're trying to solve here is y, z, cosine of x, ds. So the very first thing that I see is <coughs> what we have is we have a line integral of our um, function right here, ds. And because of the fact that we have that ds piece right here, that tells me we are going through this thing as a straightforward line integral. So what we need is we're going to do the line integral of f evaluated or parameterized with r of t dot magnitude r prime of t dt. So we need f parameterized. And the good thing is, is they've given us r of t. They've given us the parameterization right here. So we just have to plug these things in for y, z, and cosine of x, or x, and that's going to be f of r of t. So y is 3 cosine, z is 3 sine, and that's going to be x, which is t, so it's cosine t. <coughs> okay, so that's this part. Now we need r prime of t, which is the derivative of this, which is going to be 1, negative 3 sine t, 3 cosine t. <coughs> and I'm going to need the magnitude of that. Oops, which is going to be the square root of each one of these things squared. 1 squared is 1. Squaring this, you're going to get 9 sine squared t. And squaring this one, 9 cosine squared t. Which will simplify this 9 sine squared plus 9 cosine squared. Factor the 9 out. You just get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So this is going to be square root of 10. 1 plus the 9 here gives you the square root of 10. So we've got everything we need now to go ahead and power through this one. So we're going to take the integral from 0 to pi, because that's what t varies from, of f of r of t, 3 cosine t, 3 sine t, cosine t, times uh, magnitude r prime t, which is square root of 10, dt. And of course, what we want to do is take all the constants out to the front. So, um, whoops, so we got 3 times 3, which is 9, square root of 10, out to the front. Integral from 0 to pi. See, that's going to be a cosine squared t sine t dt. And this should be a pretty straightforward u substitution problem. So u would be cosine t du is negative sine t dt. So dt is du over negative sine t. We'll go ahead and change the bounds. <clears throat> so plugging in 0 for the cosine is going to give us 1. Plugging in pi will give us negative 1. That's, of course, backwards. This negative here should help us change that, though. So we'll have u squared um, sine of t times du over negative sine t. And don't forget the 9 root 10 out front. So these signs are going to cancel out. That negative will flip the bounds here. So we should have 9 root 10 integral from negative 1 to 1 of u squared du. And then this should be pretty straightforward from here. So 9 
root 10 times 1 third u cubed from negative 1 to 1. Pulling the 1 third out to the front is going to give us 3 root 10 of, see that's going to be 1 minus negative 1 or 1 plus 1. So we should get 6 root 10. And that's that line integral. Okay, not too bad for a line integral problem, but what told me that was the fact that I had some kind of a function here, ds. And that tells me, okay, we're probably just going to go ahead and parameterize this thing and do it that way. All right, number two. Evaluate the line integral of f dot dr, where the function, I'm sorry, the force is um, the vector, let's see, e to the x plus x squared y, e to the y minus xy squared. So that's a two-dimensional vector. And c is the circle x squared plus y squared equals 25 and oriented counterclockwise. So pretty much the, the what I'm looking at here, this is pretty straightforward. This is two-dimensional. This is a circle, which means that it's closed, and it's oriented counterclockwise. That's perfect for Green's theorem. And this is, again, what you're looking for. These are the things that you're going to look for when you go to um, um, do the problems. Pick those things out. What are the criteria? What do we have? So remember, Green's theorem is the double integral over d of dq dx minus dp dy dA. So we'll need dq dx. Remember this is p. Whoops, this does not look like a p at all. Other than the fact that it was green. And this is q. So dq dx, the derivative of this one with respect to x, looks like it's just going to be negative y squared. And then dp dy, the derivative of this one with respect to y, is just going to be x squared. So I'm going to have the double integral over d of dq dx, negative y squared, minus dp dy minus x squared dA. Now the fact that this thing right here is traversed by a circle tells me that we're probably going to want to do this in polar and looking at these values it looks like polar is probably going to be the easiest method. So we're going to convert this stuff to polar. Just because the domain here itself is going to be easier to define in polar. You could certainly do it in rectangular and you'd have positive and negative square roots that you'd have to deal with. Um, but it, and it could be done, but this is just going to be easier. So if we convert this to polar, we know that since it's a circle, theta will go from 0 to 2 pi. And the radius, got to go back up here and look at the circle, uh, radius goes from 0 to 5 since it's um, 25 on the right there. Negative y squared minus x squared. If you factor the negative out, you're going to get x squared plus y squared, which in polar is r squared. So this is negative r squared. We are just converting. We're not parameterizing or anything like that. So we're converting into polar. So that's going to be r dr d theta. Don't forget that extra r. Um, let's see. All this is r. There's no other thetas here. So we know that 0 to 2 pi for d theta is just going to give us 2 pi. And then I'm going to have to take an integral from 0 to 5 of negative r cubed dr. So it'll be 2 pi times negative 1 fourth r to the fourth from 0 to 5. And let's see, that's going to be negative pi halves multiplying the negative 1 fourth times the 2 pi. And then r to the fourth, um, 5 to the fourth is 25 squared, 625 minus 0. And that won't reduce anymore, so it looks like we get negative 625 pi over 2. There we go. Again, if you can do Green's theorem, it is really nice to be able to do. Alright, next example. Here 
evaluate the integral f dot dr where f is now a three-dimensional vector field um, e to the y x e to the y plus e to the x y e to the x and c is the line segment from 0 to 0 to 4 0 3 so again one of the things you're looking for first of all this is a line segment and it is three-dimensional so we cannot use Green's theorem. 3D means no Green's theorem. <coughs> and it's a line segment, so it's going to go from one endpoint to another endpoint, which means it's not closed. Um, so let's check to see, first of all, whether it's conservative, because if it's conservative, conservative, um, then we can use a uh, fundamental uh, theorem of line integrals, which isn't so bad. So how do we find out if it's conservative? If you remember, it's if the curl, because it's 3D, is equal to 0. Right? It would be conservative if it was two-dimensional, if dq dx equals dp dy, um, but it's not two-dimensional, so we can't worry about that. So let's find out the curl. Let's take the curl. I, J, K, ddx d d y d d z and remember that the curl is del which is this piece cross our function so it's e to the y x e to the y plus e to the x and y e to the x all right so let's go ahead and take the cross and see what we get so if I eliminate the i row and column, we get the derivative of this piece with respect to y, which is e to the x, minus the derivative of this piece with respect to z, which is, um, I'm sorry, that's not e to the x, that's a z up there. That's really hard, I know, to see. I'm having a hard time seeing it. That's e to the z. Uh, otherwise, I was going to say this isn't going to work. Right, come on, erase. Nope, you've got the eraser. You're showing me the eraser, but you're not erasing. Let's do it that way. Okay, here we go. All right. So this is... Now you're showing me the eraser still, but... This is so weird. Um, this is why e to the z. That's what that is up there. So this is e to the z. It's so weird that it's writing with the eraser, but it's working, so it's all that matters. Uh, the derivative of this piece with respect to z, uh, that should also be an e to the z, right? This is really strange. to the z. There we go. It's also e to the z. So hopefully you can see where this is going because that's my first component. Um, taking the j component, derivative of this piece with respect to x is nothing. The derivative of this piece with respect to z is nothing. There's a y right there. Let's just fix that. There we go. So that's zero. <coughs> Don't forget to change the sign. Still zero. Um, eliminate the k part. So the derivative of this with respect to x is e to the y. The derivative with respect to y of this is e to the y. So what you can see is that we get the zero vector. Zero, 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 which means conservative, not liberal. There we go. Which means, since this is a conservative vector field, then f has to be the same thing as del little f. So we can go ahead and find our original function f that this thing was the gradient of. This thing right here is the gradient of our capital F. So that means that these are all partials already. So f of x or f sub x is this first piece e to the y. Remember, to get back to f, we take the antiderivative of this with respect to x, which means this is going to be x e to the y plus, 
Now, don't forget, this right here now is some function, because we're in three variables, of um, not only y, but z. Some function of y and z. Because no matter what this function is, if it's a function of y and z, when you take its derivative with respect to x, it's gone, which would get you right back to e to the y. So that's good. And then we're going to come up here, and we're going to write that f sub y was this middle piece, x e to the y plus e to the x. I'm sorry, e to the z. I keep making that mistake, and I apologize because I know this is difficult to see. Whoops. And I even tried using, um, typing it in myself using my own math type e to the z. There we go. All right, so the partial with respect to y coming from this side, if I take the derivative, should match this or at least be able to give us something that we can find these pieces. So if I take the derivative of this piece with respect to um, y, it's still x e to the y. That's good. If I take the derivative of this with respect to y, what I get is, um, whoops, made, made another mistake here. Not as big this time, but I shouldn't call that f since we're trying to find f. I should call that g. You guys probably already caught that. So this is going to be plus g sub y, because I'm taking a derivative with respect to y, of yz. These two pieces match, which means that my partial derivative uh, with respect to y of my g function has to equal e to the z. So g sub y of yz equals e to the z, which means the antiderivative of this with respect to y would give me a g of yz, which is just going to be y e to the z plus some other function of z, because we have that third variable. So let's go ahead and plug in what we have. So now I'm down to the point where f equals x e to the y plus my g of y z is this piece over here. That's y e to the z plus h of z. Okay, and then we're going to go back up. We're going to bring down the z component now. The partial with respect to z is, whoops, is y e to the z. So f sub z is y e to the z. So if I now take the derivative of this, my f sub z, taking the derivative of this with respect to z is nothing. The derivative of this with respect to z is y e to the z, and the derivative of this with respect to z is simply h prime of z. These two things match, which means that h prime of z must be 0 because there's nothing here. So if h prime of z is 0, that means h of z taking the antiderivative is some constant, and we call it k. So my actual function is x e to the y plus y e to the z plus my constant k. Now, we don't actually need the constant in this case to do the problem, but it's good to know that that's what you would get for your generalized function. And the reason that we don't need it, whoops, the reason that we don't need it is because the integral over c of f dot dr is going to be the same thing as f of b minus f of a, fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. So the constant's going to go away when you subtract this, so you really don't need the constant anyway. And remember that that b and that a are really have to be parameterized, so this really should be f of r of b minus f of r of a. And r of b and r of a are going to be evaluated as 0, 2, 0, 4, 0, 3. So 4, 0, 3 is the first one. So if I plug in 4, 0, 3 into my function, 4 is x, 
y is 0 and 3 is z. So that means that's going to be 4 times e to the 0, which is 4, plus um, y is 0, so that's gone, so it's 4. 0, I guess. And then minus, the second point was, I believe it was 0 to 0. Yeah, 0 to 0. So y is the only thing that has a value there. So 0 times this is gone. Uh, y does have a value of 2 times e to the 0, which is 1. So that would be 2. So we should just get 2. There you, there you have it. All right. I think we're just going to do two more problems in this video. It's starting to get a little bit long. I think we're at 20 minutes already. Um, and then we'll do the last three in the last video. Um, all right, number four, evaluate the integral given below, where f is given to us as xz, negative 2y, 3x, and s is the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4 with outward orientation. So again, the things that we are looking for, first of all, this is 3D. So Green's theorem is out. No Green's theorem. However, this is a surface. It's got outward orientation, and it's a sphere, which means that it is closed. So it's a closed surface, outward orientation, three-dimensional. This is the perfect idea for doing the divergence theorem. And remember that the divergence theorem is the triple integral over E of the divergence of F dV. <coughs> and we're going to do this, I mean this is a sphere, so we're going to do this in spherical coordinates almost definitely. So first of all, let's calculate the divergence of F. Remember that the divergence of F is um, del dot our function. So it's the derivative of this piece with respect to x, which is z. The derivative of plus the derivative of this piece with respect to y, minus 2, plus the derivative of this piece with respect to z, which is 0. So our divergence is z minus 2. That's not a very difficult function that we're going to have to deal with. Um, we will do this in spherical. It's a sphere, so this should be pretty straightforward, I would think. So we'll get 0 to 2 pi for theta, 0 to pi for phi, and let's see, the radius is going to be 2, so 0 to 2 for um, rho. So we do need to change this into spherical coordinates. So remember that z in spherical is rho cosine phi. So it'll be rho cosine phi minus 2. Okay, we did not parameterize it. We're just changing it into spherical coordinates. So we need the extra um, rho squared sine phi, the conversion factor, and then d rho, oops, d rho, d phi, d theta. All right, so let's take a look real quick here. There's no thetas in here whatsoever. So I can go ahead and just do that part. And of course, again, d theta 0 to 2 pi is just going to give us our 2 pi. Um, I am going to have phi's and rho's, so I'm going to have to combine those things. So we'll have 0 to pi, 0 to 2. Let's see, distributing all this is going to give me rho cubed. Oh, thank you for the update. Um, let's see, sine phi, cosine phi, minus 2 rho squared, sine phi, d rho, d phi. Alright, so taking the antiderivative of these things, first of all, with respect to rho. Come on, there we go, 2 pi, don't forget all that. All right, antiderivative with respect to rho, 1 fourth rho to the fourth sine phi cosine phi minus, what's that, 2 thirds rho cubed sine phi. We'll evaluate that from 0 to 2 and then d phi. So plugging in a 2. It's going to be, what, 16 over 4, so that's 4 
sine phi, cosine phi. Plugging in a 2 here, that's 8 times 2 is 16, so minus 16 thirds sine phi. Plugging in a 0 gives me nothing, so we're good there. All right, so now we'll have to take the antiderivative. We're going to have to do a quick u sub for this first part. So u is going to equal, I'm, I prefer to go with sine on this one, although it doesn't matter. So du is going to be cosine phi, d phi. And then d phi is du over cosine phi. Now technically you should split these integrals into two separate integrals. I'm going to change all the bounds back. I'm not going to change the bounds here, so it's going to be okay, but technically that's what you should do. So 2 pi, 0 to pi, 4 u times uh, cosine phi. That's really messed up. cosine phi times du over cosine phi minus 16 thirds sine phi d phi. So this is going to cancel out the cosines and we're going to get a 4u here. So when I take the antiderivative that's going to be 4u squared over 2. So 2u squared but remember that u is sine. So it'll be 2 sine squared phi. Antiderivative here with respect to sine, antiderivative of sine, that's just 16, is um, that's going to be a comma of positive 16 thirds cosine phi. And we'll evaluate that from 0 to pi. Let's see, 2 pi, plugging in pi first, that's 0, that's going to be 1, so that's 16 thirds, minus, plugging in a 0, that's 0, that's going to be um, 1, I said something wrong, didn't I? I plug in pi, that's negative 1, so that should be minus 16 thirds, so otherwise this is 0, and that's not right. So here we get 16 thirds minus 16 thirds, which is 32 thirds, times the 2 pi is negative 64 pi thirds. If you're using a divergence theorem, not too bad. All right. Like I said, one more for this example because it's going to be a long video. <coughs> Number five, find the work done by the force um, x squared i plus minus xy j and moving a particle along a quarter circle given as r of t so it's parameterized for us it's not closed because it says quarter circle <coughs> um, we can check to see if it's conservative real quick so let's see it's two-dimensional possibility of Green's theorem so dq dx is let's see, q with respect to x is negative y, dp dy, yeah, this is not going to be conservative because that's going to be 0. So not conservative. So Green's theorem is out. So it looks like we're probably just going to have to push this, push through this thing the old-fashioned old way, just doing a standard line integral. So our function parameterized <clears throat> so let's see, it tells us that r is cosine t sine t. So we're going to plug in r uh, cosine t for all my x's, so that's going to be cosine squared t. And then it's going to be cosine t times sine t, but negative. So negative sine t cosine t. We are going to need r prime, because we'll need its magnitude. So let's see, r prime is going to be, what is that, negative sine t, cosine t? Negative sine t, cosine t. And the magnitude of that, sine squared of sine t, 
square root of sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so I don't really have to worry about the magnitude portion of that. <coughs> so f dot dr, our line integral over f dot dr, is going to be the dot product of this. Let's see, integral goes from, oh, come on, there we go. Integral goes from 0 to pi halves. That's what it tells me up here. <coughs> um, f dot um, r prime of t is going to be, is that negative sine cosine squared t, oops, forgot my t, uh, minus, dotting these things, sine cosine squared t, dt. which really just gives me two of those things right there. So I'm going to be taking the integral from 0 to pi halves of minus 2 sine t cosine squared t dt. We can take the negative 2 out to the front. And we'll be taking the integral of sine t cosine squared t. And once again, this is just going to be a pretty straightforward, relatively quick, u substitution. So u is going to be cosine t in this case. du will be negative sine t dt. And dt will be du over negative sine t. If you all can hear my dog in the background, I apologize. So we'll get negative 2 Integral from, I am going to change the bounds in this case, so cosine of 0 is 1, pi has is 0. This will be sine t u squared du over negative sine t. Signs will cancel out. The negative will help me flip the bounds. I still need the negative on the 2. u squared du. So we'll end up with negative 2 times 1 third u cubed from 0 to 1. Plugging in the 1 is going to give me 1 third, so we should just get negative 2 thirds. All right, that is plenty enough for this video. I will come back and do the last three. Hopefully, I can get those done in less than 20.